All right, I think we're ready to go. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I can't see you. It's, these lights are glaring at me. So, um, so I think we're giving folks a couple of minutes to come in. Okay. All right. So uh, I appreciate you being here. Um, hope you're having a good summit, a great summit. Uh, my name is Ashish Nadkarni, and I'm joined by my colleague Larry Carvalho. Um, we are part of IDC's research. Uh, team. I'm part of the infrastructure team, and Larry is part of the software team, and he covers uh, platform uh, technologies, and I'll let him provide more details on his research area. But my research area is primarily infrastructure-related, storage, computing, and uh, software-defined infrastructure. So um, we, we are here to kind of talk about IDC's research related to OpenStack, and uh, it's a part of an ongoing um, umbrella research, um, which we call a software-defined infrastructure. And um, we're here to sort of talk about some of the um, findings at a broader level, why people are looking at software-defined and what is it that, um, what are some of the key benefits that um, they s s try to kind of, you know, ob obtain from going from into an infrastructure that is um, software-defined in nature. I'm getting used to this, so please bear with me. Um, so yeah, so we are we have literally split our presentation into two uh, sections. There's the software-defined infrastructure piece, which I'll cover, and then Larry will cover um, cloud and open source. So he has some research that is kind of related to that. So um, just to sort of set the stage, um, you know, we are talking about an evolving data landscape and. Um, certainly on stage today, we talked about uh, the different types of applications, different types of applications creating different types of data sets. And um, it's all about moving the data and compute closer and closer so the movement is uh, minimized. Um, we need to kind of run the workloads right where the data is located. Um, you know, we want to have a geodispersed infrastructure. Um, location awareness, so kind of looking at different types of data, app data, M2M data, you know, IoT, mobile, all of this sort of coming together, um, and we, we are hearing constantly that the older infrastructure models are um, becoming obsolete. They're going by way of the Dodo, and so really people are looking at newer infrastructures. You're, you're all here, your colleagues are here, to look at why and how we can implement the new next generation of infrastructure. And so we um, kind of started this research two years ago to really look at um, what is it that um, people are looking for. And so software-defined infrastructure, it doesn't really do justice to things like OpenStack um, or com competing standards. Um, but what it really is is a set of uh, attributes that people are looking for. So from a platform perspective, certainly industry standards, um, you know, elastic, open. From a value perspective, they want to be able to decouple um, the software from the hardware. Um, and it's all about speed, efficiency, agility. Um, automation is certainly top of everyone's mind. They want to be able to go beyond just provisioning and configuration to an ongoing management paradigm that is totally different. Um, and then finally, um, they, they want to be able to deliver the you know, unified units of IT. You know, we don't have to have silos of compute, network, storage, um, and, and, and really policy-driven, um, being able to have a unified service-level orchestration and um, service-level attributes that are um, tied to you know, predefined policies and such. So key thing is open and elastic automation. Um, is, is the underlying principle for software-defined infrastructure. And a lot of those get carried over into, you know, when people are implementing OpenStack, these principles are alive and well. And so we talk to people who are in different kind of stages of um, software-defined infrastructure, and clearly test and dev and, you know, proof of concept is high on people's mind. But look at all the others, right? I mean, there's production less than six months, production six to 12 months, and production more than 12 months. And then it jives with some of the survey results from the OpenStack Foundation that people are, in fact, moving SDI into layers of uh, production. Um, and they're cautiously moving there, but they're surely moving there. Um, it is something that is eventually going to happen. Oops. 
I don't know what this is. Um, all right, so then how are people deploying um, software-defined infrastructure? So clearly heterogeneous applications is the, the most common use case. Um, you know, private cloud and um, infrastructure as a service is, is lower, but sort of really looking at applications. So from an application perspective, you know, different types of projects make it to SDI a lot more quickly than a certain um, service as a service kind of a use case. And homogeneous applications are a lot lower from that perspective. And um, so we talked with a whole lot of users on how and why and what of SDI. And these were the five key findings um, on software-defined infrastructure. The first one is it has to accelerate um, the time to market. The second is it has to deliver on the promise of automation. Third is cost reduction is, is certainly key. Um, it, you know, we have to be able to avoid vendor lock-in. So, um, you know, this is not something that, you know, could be a... So, so vendor lock-in, and then finally to increase um, agility uh, in the environment. Sort of going back to the old, um, the, the, the slide before, which is older infrastructure paradigms are becoming obsolete, partly because they can't deliver on these five um, key things that we're, um, we're uh, uh, finding out. So time to market. So we want, we are con constantly hearing from users who are basically saying, hey, my business wants me to uh, respond more quickly. I don't have the luxury of implementing um, infrastructure um, in the old ways, which used to take days, weeks, months. And I want to be able to quickly um, you know, deliver infrastructure units to the business um, so that they can you know, develop applications or you know, deploy applications. Um, and, and the expectation here is that um, IT deliver um, you know, their service at the same rate as public cloud. And I think you know, the, the, um, Boris from Mirantis summed it up very well, where you know, even you know, inter his internal teams were willing to go to the public cloud if you know, the, inter the internal IT folks were not able to deliver on their uh, requests. So we have that option. Many companies have that option. Um, and they're willing to use that option if their internal IT uh, doesn't respond that well. Um, so the th second one is automation. So automation is really time to market, accelerating time to market, avoiding human errors, um, and to abstract the complexity of the infrastructure. So it's really about taking um, you know, units of infrastructure and uh, delivering them in a way that is kind of automated. Um, it's an acknowledgement um, that automation has to be end-to-end. -end. It cannot just be in one place and not and lack, be completely lacking in another. Um, and it, it's really work in progress. So people will tell us that um, you know, they are still not there yet when it comes to automation. They are still in the process of um, you know, f becoming fully automated. Now, clearly, the maturity level change depends from company to company. You know, so someone uh, at a service provider level has probably got a whole lot more automation in their environment than someone who's just starting off on a journey um, for software-defined infrastructure. Cost savings, again, it's about moving to an agile cost model where you don't have to provision storage or provision compute um, way ahead of time. Um, and you want to have both CapEx savings as well as OpEx savings. And it's about um, savings from um, using standard hardware and then savings from using you know, orchestration and automation so that you are using less um, resources in the process, both human resources as well as technical resources. Um, the word commodity has become a bad word. Um, a lot of times people prefer the term industry standard. Um, industry standard uh, or commodity, pick your, pick your term. The, the, the goal here or goal for folks is when you standardize your hardware, irrespective of whether it is for compute, storage, or networking, um, you get those cost savings. And those cost savings go across the board. It, they are horizontal in nature, not specific to any particular type of infrastructure. Vendor lock-in. So we heard loud and clear today that one of the um, you know, people associate standard APIs with lack of vendor, I mean, with vendor or no vendor lock-ins. The more standardization you have, 
the less the vendor lock-in. And um, once you standardize on hardware, even once you standardize on APIs, you're automatically minimizing vendor lock-in. Now, vendor lock-in and dependency is not so much um, a curse as much as it is really a, um, a sort of the opposite effect of choice, right? So um, you want to be able to uh, leverage, um, oops. You want to be able to, um, sorry, I'm running on battery, that's probably why. Um, so you want to be able to leverage standard hardware and then use different software, purpose-built software that delivers different uh, feature function. And what I mean by that, so for, for example, um, you might run um, Ceph on standard hardware. You might run Swift on standard hardware. You might also choose to run um, Scale.io or, or um, uh, you know, Nutanix or, or Nexenta, or I'm just rambling out names here. But the point is they all run on standard hardware. So you can choose the uh, stack that you want to run for delivering the right type of storage service, as an example. Same thing with choice of hypervisor. Same thing with networking. It's really about um, using as many standard industry standard components and then using purpose-built software with standard APIs so that you can, um, it almost becomes a Lego brick, Lego brick approach. And then finally, agility. Um, you know, we want to be able to respond to business demands want to be able to um, you know, automatically dial up or dial down based on resource requirements. So you might have um, on demand, you know, some, you know, if your business has a burst of um, you know, um, demand from your business, then you want to be able to dial up your infrastructure. And then when you go back to the normal mode, you, know, you want to be able to dial down the infrastructure. So you want to have um, agility in your environment. So sort of summing it up, um, people um, are demanding, businesses are demanding a new infrastructure paradigm. Um, you know, really it is about, can my infrastructure scale on demand? Is it highly agile? Um, is, does it e allow easy cost control? Um, you know, it's sort of a shift from CapEx to OpEx. And is it service-based? Does it allow me to offer um, my infrastructure and, and hence higher levels? As, uh, as a service, as an internal service. And that is the promise. Um, I don't think people are there yet. I don't think businesses are there yet. Um, clearly, it's a sort of a meeting in the middle from second uh, platform to third platform, which is really, um, think of it as traditional IT, and, and as Gartner puts it, bimodal IT. People are along the journey here, and so is their infrastructure transformation is a process. Um, and I think it's going to take a few uh, months, if not years, to, um, to really get there. And our research is showing that um, this is work in progress. We certainly are seeing a lot more traction, but um, we're not there yet. And this sort of sums it up in terms of um, how we see um, a software-defined infrastructure. And the, as the theme of this presentation says, this is really you know, a proxy for OpenStack adoption, and OpenStack is one of the ways in which um, folks can implement a software-defined infrastructure, as people call it, software-defined data center, and, um, and therefore you know, morph themselves into um, being future-proof for applications um, of the future to deliver business um, uh, in the future. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, call my friend, uh, colleague Larry. Okay, so now I get into the spotlight. So thanks for joining this session. We're going to talk about cloud and open source and what we have learned from some of our surveys. And um, just to give you the survey results, what we are seeing, uh, and this is a bunch uh, of questions we asked, uh, large group uh, last in the, about the December, January time frame. And you know, what, we are, what we are seeing from uh, overall is a high interest in open source in this, in this slide. But what I want to now break this up, because there are about 12 different questions we ask them on different open source initiatives. Um, if you look at uh, you know, what is you know, the cloud management category, you, know, you, you might think that cloud stack is totally off, but people still are interested in that. That's one of the uh, areas they, are, they care about. And in this slide, and I'll talk a little more later, there is, we ask them a question of OpenStack with and without distribution, um, you know, with, with support. 
from somebody. So both of them are about the same, but obviously with support is a little more. So you, you need to you know, look at that. Uh, obviously, there are different reasons that different customers um, look for support or not support, and depending on the type of the customer. I kind of categorize both of these as cloud platforms, both Docker and uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, also, in a little uh, different way, b uh, big interest in that uh, from a group of customers. And then when you look at cloud orchestration, Chef, Puppet, Tosca, you know, this slide, this looks like it a little more when you look at an overall view, and I'm going to tie it with maturity of customers in a later slide. So this interest in continuous integration, continuous delivery is still quite high uh, within customers. And then now when you go to data streaming, just we already understand the growth of data, the importance of real-time data connected with automation, internet of things, uh, this is not off the radar for most customers. And um, you know, finally, when you look at integration, you took, talk about multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. Um, that is another area of interest for, for customers. So I'm just going to go now, and when you look at it separately, you see there is a higher interest of uh, cloud management you know, because we don't have uh, you know, some of the overlap between uh, these areas. Uh, the cloud management, which is obviously uh, OpenStack and CloudStack, still dominates the interest from customers, especially on a uh, you know, private or on-premise uh, environment, uh, followed by cloud platforms and cloud orchestration, which is about the same. And then you've got data streaming and you know, cloud integration. So these are, again, broken up by category. Now, what we do with an IDC when we do surveys is break up the customers and ask them, where are you on your cloud journey? Because comparing two customers, you know, they're not all the same. So we look at, are they just starting in an exploratory environment, or have they moved all the way? So we break it down into very clear ways, ask them detailed questions to see where they are in their cloud journey, ad hoc, where they're just exploring, or opportunistic, where they have now you know, got into a collaborative and standardized environment, followed by now they have a repeatable strategy they cover and, and uh, uh, you know, meeting the needs of each group within the organization. Or they're going all the way up to an industrial cloud, um, which could be what you know, GE or Siemens and others are doing, uh, you know, building that. Or, and they are, have actually made it into a practice within the organization. And otherwise going all the way into innovation and transformation of their fundamental strategy so that they can meet the disruptive challenges within the organization. So once we look at this, we took, took our um, responses and then mapped it up with them. And here you'll see a very interesting uh, you know, difference. The ones who are more on the uh, forward thinking or have already adopted cloud, uh, managed and optimized, have a much higher interest in open source. So you can see that they now value the community you know, uh, improvement of a product rather than just buy it from one company. But also shows that they have now collected the skills. They have understood what it is to use a cloud from one provider to now saying, I'm going to go into an environment that is not going to be locked in. I'll be able to uh, contribute my value to this and, and uh, get value from a community uh, rather than um, you know, work with one company alone. So we are, this is you know, something that you know, you've got to see from a maturity standpoint where are you know, companies uh, viewing this. They have now learned from their past experience and have made a decision to go with an open source strategy um, and uh, you know, collect from there. Um, and now if you start breaking it up again, even by category, so on the left-hand side, you'll see just the ad hoc and opportunistic. And on the right hand, you'll see repeatable, managed, and optimized. Here you'll see the cloud management uh, much, much higher at 70 you know, 75% total uh, from repeatable, uh, you know, for, from what their interest is uh, in open source. 
So whether they're getting it from a public or, or uh, in a hybrid uh, environment, uh, these fall in different categories and um, all of these are of interest, but you got to look at integration also is not off the list. Everywhere from integration to data to orchestration and platforms are all on the interest list of customers. Although we are here at this conference primarily talking cloud management, uh, there are many aspects of you know, cloud that you need to pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit on you know, the key takeaways and then leave some time for, for Q&A from us. Um, so on the vendors, uh, so I'm breaking this up into vendors, uh, customers, and standards organization. First of all, um, open source, open standards are playing a very important role. That's the overall view. But for vendors, I see that there's only one company, really, Red Hat, who has really learned how to monetize uh, the complete cloud open source and make money out of it. Uh, other than that, a lot of customers are still in a com combination of you know, open source and proprietary uh, software. Uh, so they need to look at what's going to be the impact on their monetization, on their business model, and how are they going to make money off of it. Uh, and then if you're all on open source, what is your unique differentiator? And I see a lot of uh, customers thinking, yes, we got portability, we are not locked in, but how do I really differentiate myself? Why am I different? And a lot of them are talking about the foundational aspects, their infrastructure or their network, or there is some unique aspect, security. And what do I do different? What do I bring to the table that others who are also using the same open source are not doing? Um, so you're going to see that as an important area that customers are going to look at as a result, I think vendors have to very clearly define why, why IBM versus HP, who are both doing OpenStack, versus somebody else. Um, on the customer side, um, I think you'll heard on the previous presentations also talking about skills. And what I think from customers is they all have a lack of skills, not just on use of cloud technology, but the culture that has to be changed to try a cloud strategy and, and move in a cloud first direction. Um, I, I live in Cincinnati and I talk to a lot of large companies over there and one of the things they tell me is their biggest difference between Silicon Valley, born in the cloud companies and them is they don't try enough. And they have never had that as thinking that I can take a concept and try it out in two weeks or four weeks or six weeks and make a change. They typically are thinking of six months, eight months before they even find out whether they can do it or, or not. That's a cultural difference and I think that's tied with you know, what skills you bring and you know, how do you go adopting cloud. Um, the next one for customers is you know, set a clear policy. You know, what are you going to do with open standards? What are you allowed to do? Are you going to use one with uh, support or without support? Do you have the skills and the high-end skills that you need you know, for adopting a non-supported you know, cloud version? And that is a big difference, and you've got to make it very clear right from the get-go. Uh, you may have seen a lot of uh, uh, strategy that you know, GE has put out, and they know exactly how they're going to use it, not only that, but also when you adopt a cloud uh, technology, they have automated ways of seeing whether you adhere to the policy or not. Otherwise, it'll take you forever before you start something up. And uh, then going to the standards organizations, like the, open, you know, the, uh, the foundation we are here with, or even the Cloud Foundry or, or others, um, do they have awareness of these uh, standards of these capabilities that they are now bringing to the table. The biggest issue for customers is lock-in because they have been locked in before everywhere from databases to operating systems to hardware. And now they need to say that this, uh, understand that this is an approach they can take 
and prevent lock-in. And that awareness has to be built within customers. And finally, I see a lot of the open source foundations not involving customers enough. There is always vendors who are you know, typically getting recognized for how much code they contributed, but you got to also recognize the customers as to what they're doing, even if they're providing you feedback or, and they're giving you um, code, uh, contributing to the open source initiative. Can you recognize them when they provide that? So I don't know how much time we have, but I think we have a mic up there. And if there is any questions, uh, you know, we'll be happy to take them. Or our contact information is up here. You can send us an email or contact us via Twitter or anything like that. Any questions? There are two mics up here, I think. If not, I don't know what time we have. We have some yeah, time to give you back. Fantastic, or we've put you to sleep. So. <laughs> But thank you for hanging in there. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.